My name is Liza Cordero, and I am with REL Appalachia. Um, we are here today and very honored that you have joined us uh, for this presentation on early warning systems. The very first slide that I want to talk about just for a moment is what is REL Appalachia? Um, some of you may have heard of us previously. We are one of 10 laboratories that uh, are in the United States, and we're administered by the U.S. Department of Education, specifically the Institute of Education Sciences, which is known as IES. Um, the key so everyone understands is that we're here to partner with you, to partner with policymakers and with practitioners. So events like these, specifically talking about EWS and what you can do on a local level and how you can build your own systems is par for the course for us at REL Appalachia as well as for the other RELs throughout the nation. So the very next slide talks a little bit about exactly what we uh, what we do at REL Appalachia. I mentioned that we do um, several of these types of webinars, but we also do uh, research that is the um, really uh, the main source of what we work on day in and day out. It is that research. Secondly, we do hands-on workshops, technical assistance, where we go into school systems and they can make whatever, whatever request they have, um, some very important topic for them. And we, as uh, REL Appalachia, will go into our key states. We work, and I should have started the conversation to say that we work with West Virginia, Virginia, Tennessee, and Kentucky. We also do literature reviews, and some of the things um, that we focus on, the very first bullet that you'll see there is early warning systems, of course, college and career readiness, effective data use, um, classroom technology, uh, so on and so on. Um, Today's event, we would love if you have the opportunity to tweet about it, to tell folks what you're learning, how you're learning. Uh, we do have a specific hashtag for this event. It's hashtag rel underscore EWS, and that is uh, a hashtag that individuals across the nation are using for this series. And then, of course, we at REL Appalachia have our own specific Twitter account, which is at REL underscore Appalachia. So please uh, feel free to follow us and um, to like us and be part of our network. The very next slide uh, is a little bit of information about the fact that this webinar is part of a larger series. Um, IES, as I mentioned, launched this series in 2016, and we are honored to be part of this series. Uh, some of you may know that we had an earlier webinar on EWS. We did that back in May. And overall, if you wanted to learn more about the webinar series um, or even the particular webinar that I uh, mentioned from last May, uh, you can go to our REL Appalachia site. And at that site, um, you will see events along the top bar. If you click on events and then scroll down to past events and then just find the May event, click on that. It will give you the PowerPoint presentations, a recording of the webinar, and all sorts of different uh, links back to the larger EWS series being produced and sponsored by IES. So the goals of today's webinar, specifically, we would hope that you have a better understanding of EWS models and how they apply to your particular systems. And as Jennifer mentioned, please, if you have questions along the way, uh, type, them, type them out for us, and we will get to those questions at the end of the presentation. We also hope that you gain an understanding of how EWS indicators and data can be applied and identified to at-risk students. And then finally, becoming aware of resources that districts can use effectively developed on EWS. I mentioned the um, resources that we already have on the REL Appalachia site, but there are resources as well on the IES site, and we'll provide you with more information throughout this presentation. So who are today's presenters and facilitators? As I mentioned, I'm Liza. Um, coming straight after me is Rolf Blank, and he is a uh, PhD, a senior fellow at Newark at the University of Chicago. Also joining us is Lance Selfa. He's a principal research scientist from that same organization, Newark at the University of Chicago. And then we also have Marco Munoz, 
PhD, Priority Schools Director, Jefferson County, Kentucky Public Schools. So um, a good group of people who really know their stuff when it comes to EWS. We've been uh, working on these presentations and trying to make sure that what we're presenting to you to you, um, you have key takeaways that you walk away from this hour and a half presentation and actually have next steps. So there we are, pictures of all of us, so you can put a face to uh, a voice as we're uh, speaking today. And uh, with no further ado, I'd like to speak about the agenda very quickly, the welcome and the overview. Um, a review of the May 16 webinar, and that's the one I had mentioned previously. Principles of data visualizations, and we will focus a great deal of timing on that, time on that, using data visualizations to support your priority schools, and telling your story with these data visualizations questions and answers at the end, and then we'll have some wrap up and some feedback. So with that said, I think I've already taken up too much of your time. Now we want to get to the real meat of the presentation, and that is with Rolf Blank. And I'm going to now turn over the presentation to Rolf and say, Rolf, thank you so much for agreeing to be part of all of this. And I am bringing, ah, wait a minute, I gotta grab you and bring you down. There you go. And hopefully now you, are in control of the presentation. Rolf? Thanks very much, Liza. <clears throat> we at, uh, at NORC are happy to be part of this uh, webinar series, and we're partnering with REL Appalachia on uh, organizing the two webinars this year uh, with IES. And uh, the NORC or NORC is a, a large research center, and we are social scientists and education researchers and evaluators. And we kind of specialize in working with large data sets and data systems. And uh, our background in working a lot with research studies and evaluation uh, fit well with this, the goals of these uh, webinars uh, for this year. So we are happy to be partners in, in organizing these webinars. Um, I want to just highlight a couple of the <clears throat> large findings we had from the first webinar in May, and this is hopefully it will be a good lead-in to our, our work today about data visualization. And what we were focusing on in May was some of the outstanding research and development that has gone on now for about 10 years with early warning systems. And the whole idea of early warning systems has grown and evolved over that time. Uh, it came from research, and particularly uh, work at John Hop Johns Hopkins University, uh, where they started identifying uh, some of the uh, particular indicators that across school systems and across states uh, are very predictive of students uh, not completing high school or not progressing uh, through the grades in high school and have a high risk of dropping out. And so as a result of that research, uh, people across the country have started focusing on their own data and how they can highlight the indicate, those indicators that they can, they can use and they can um, access and provide to their educators to allow them to um, work directly with the students that have the highest, highest potential for uh, dropping out. So this is both a effectiveness and an efficiency measure because it allows us to use resources wisely in terms of our time and in terms of how we're going to work with students to uh, best advance them and which students we should work on, work with the most and what is it that they need. So it's important that uh, a school district use its own data to uh, provide early warning systems. So that way they can use aggregate data or disaggregated data to focus on the students within schools that need, need the most help. Uh, and so our research allows us to say that we want to focus on individual students and of course, 
the access to those data for individual students is going to depend upon the person's uh, access to identifiable information. Um, so the three largest pre predictors are attendance and behavior, um, grades uh, at a particular, uh, in particular courses, and their test scores. So those are the, the best predictors. And the combination of those um, three indicators, uh, combining them, makes them more powerful than using them individually. Um, so one of the key steps is identifying what is the threshold level of each predictor so that um, we, know, we are pretty sure that if the student is at this level of, for example, low grades or not passing grades in the majority of their courses, that they are going to be uh, students with a high probability of something else. Uh, what attendance level should we be focusing on uh, so that we don't um, spend too much time on students and attendance is fairly average. Um, and <clears throat> then we want to try out the system that the indicators that we've uh, identified and see if they, in fact, do predict a high percentage of the students who have who have already dropped out. So we can use our data to look backwards in order to make sure that it's going to work well when we look forward. Uh, and then a key point that we, we highlighted in the May webinar is how do we go about organizing a system to work with administrators and teachers and helping them to be trained to figure out how to use the indicators and the data. So that's an important part that we highlighted in our May webinar. Uh, now, we worked in the May webinar with a, an experienced um, uh, data uh, coordinator and leader in, uh, in Nashville Metro School System, Laura Hansen, and these are some of the highlights that she provided that we're bringing forward to this webinar. Um, so the data system that we are going to work with uh, includes the people that are going to use the data, the processes of analyzing the data, and the technology. So all of those things need to be brought together. So the system needs to be considered very carefully. Um, we don't want to focus on single data points. So for example, um, test scores, for example. If we're only looking at the test scores, that's not going to tell us enough about the students that we're working with. We want to look at a range of indicators and combine information from them. Um, we also have to have data that's reliable, so it's not something based on just a few observations, but we want a fairly large uh, set of data that we can work with. It has to be timely. We don't want to be looking at data that's a few years old, but rather up to date. And it has to provide us some steps about taking action. Um, so that we, this data will lead us towards things that we will focus on this school year, not only this school year, but this semester, but in fact this month and this week. Uh, the, the thing that Laura emphasized was that we need to <clears throat> be able to provide an early warning that is early enough so teachers can do something about it early in the semester, early in the school year. Um, also, we can't just provide the data to the teacher. We have to provide a way for them to understand and be knowledgeable and so they become the experts. And so we don't just hand them the dash, dashboard if, we, if that's the system we're working uh, in. The, from the May webinar, here is our link that, that Liza mentioned. Also, I want to mention that in that webinar, we have a set of references and resources about that research I was talking about. There's some excellent examples from our Chicago school system where they've been using early warning systems for more than 10 years, and they were able to track excellent progress in reducing dropout. And so their data is very rich to be able to provide examples about how to move forward. Uh, I'm going to turn it over to uh, Lance and Marco, I just want to mention that Lance Salfa is a person that's been working on data visualization and data system uh, studies with data systems for some time and he's a lot of expertise. 
uh, in case you are immersed only in education, you should be aware that data visualization is a huge field across many, many fields, including business, social science, uh, management. Uh, visualization is the name of the game these days in, um, in using data. And so we're really happy to be a part of that. Uh, we're also happy to have Marco Munoz with us from Jefferson County, Kentucky. And I've known Marco a long time in terms of his work with research and evaluation and using data. And he's in a great position now to help us out on this webinar because he's heading up the uh, priority schools activity in Jefferson County. So there's a link between data and action. So I'm going to turn it over to Lance now, and uh, he'll move us forward on data visualization. Okay, Lance. Okay. Thanks, Rolf. Um, there we go. <laughs> yeah, thanks. Uh, well, to talk about data visualization and how it can help early warning systems, I, I want to start with a basic definition of data visualization. And here's one, and there are many out there, but here's one that are from some experts in data visualization and evaluation that's from a collection edited by uh, Tariq Assam of the Claremont Graduate University and the data visualization specialist, uh, Stephanie Evergreen. And just by the way, Many of the references that I'll be pointing to throughout this presentation are available at the end in full references at the end of the webinar. But I think it's a good working definition of data visualization. It's about turning raw data into images that then allow us to see the patterns and relationships within the data at a glance. And this allows us to explore and examine the data and then crucially to communicate the findings from them. Let's see, have a little trouble on the advance here. There we go. Okay. Uh, actually, so there we go. Data visualization is powerful because it takes advantage of our visual system's ability to uh, process and understand patterns. And it helps to take spreadsheets and databases, you know, those things that are full of columns and rows of numbers, and to turn them into information that can provide educators and the broader public so the insights uh, that they need. It, visualization is one technique that can help administrators and teachers to address that dilemma that we often hear of people being data rich uh, but information poor. And understanding that also helps to communicate the data uh, to a wider public. Now, data visualization works when it cues into what Colin Ware is a data visualization uh, expert at the University of New Hampshire, what he calls visual thinking. The science, uh, the neuroscience of visual thinking tells us that we can only process about three objects in our visual working memory at a time. So to get the information from our eyes to our brain, we have built-in ways of maximizing the amount of information that we can get from limited amounts of data before we then move our gaze somewhere else. So we use quick assessments of features of objects like size, color, orientation, and motion to capture our attention so that it helps us to focus in on things more clearly. So the tables of numbers here on this slide sort of illustrate that point. If I asked you to pick out the twos, in the table, it's a lot easier to do that in the table on the right where the twos are colored in a different color and highlighted in red than it is in the table on the left, which has the identical set of numbers uh, in it. So this actually is one thing, and I'll talk about color later, but how color and other features can be used to highlight the findings that we really want to point to. Our visual system is also very adept at finding patterns. So in this example, without even knowing what data this image represents, you can see that there are two lines, one labeled male, the other one labeled female, and they run together at one point, then they diverge with the line labeled female running above the one labeled male. Now, what this is is a table from the Census Bureau showing the percentage of 25 to 29-year-olds who completed a bachelor's or higher degree by sex between 1995 and 2015, 
And by looking at those patterns, you can actually make the conclusion from this uh, picture here that it tells us that more women or more younger women, uh, younger adults who are women, more than men are earning BAs or higher in the 21st century. And that's pretty obvious when you look at the patterns of the two lines. Now finally, we use symbols and images to prompt our memory for meaning uh, that the symbols represent, the symbol store. And here I probably don't need to explain what this symbol means because we've all learned it from uh, our daily experience and from certain cultural norms that it sort of represents. And if data visualization can use symbols that trigger these kind of prompts to our memory too, it's actually very effective. So the point of understanding these basic elements of visual thinking is that uh, keeping them in mind will help us to craft better, simpler, and clearer visualizations. Visualizations can be very elaborate and beautiful, but, they, but they're most useful for the purposes uh, of EWS and probably for most of the people that are uh, listening to this webinar. They're most useful for the purposes that, that we're uh, set about when we're there, they're simple and clear, and when they achieve uh, what the data visualization expert Stephen Few calls eloquence through simplicity, saying a lot with few uh, pieces of data. I'd like to illustrate some of these points with an example from the May webinar that was adapted from the Metro Nashville um, early warning system that uh, Rolf had alluded to earlier. Here we see uh, on, this, on this dashboard, and just to, to note too, uh, the dashboard is sort of a picture uh, that you see all in one, on one screen of a number of indicators. And actually, the way that the dashboard is set up, I believe, from Metro Nashville is that uh, one can actually be able to drill down, go to each one of these elements, and then click below it and find the actual data for, um, for the individual students. But here's a, at a summary level, we see there are five key indicators on this screen, or a collection of five main indicators. And we know this because each has a border around it. That's, it's a mental feature of our visual perception that's called enclosure. We sort of assume that something has a box around it. It's something different from something else that has a box around it. So it actually helps us to mentally segment what's on the screen. We see the, highlight, the height of the bars uh, on the left that are used to measure trends and absenteeism and the proficiency in different subjects that we see on the right, the red and green bars. Color is also used here too, so that you see on the, on the right that uh, the percent proficient in those different subject matter areas is the green. Uh, and in the middle, and this is, uh, goes to what uh, Rolf was talking about in terms of the um, at-risk indicators, these are actually, I think, the main at-risk indicators that are used, and they're actually color-coded because they actually show uh, from the intensity moving from yellow to orange to red, that it actually flags students that are at those different levels. And obviously when they're at the red, that's the, the, the students that really need the greatest help and the most intervention to make sure they stay on track. Uh, finally, note the use of symbols in the columns in the bottom center there uh, that show the percent of daily attendance for each quarter. Now, the, uh, the flat line and the down arrow tell us at a glance uh, which direction attendance rates are going. They either haven't changed or they've declined. And without having to look at all those numbers there, we sort of get that summary just by understanding those symbols. Now to even, and this is actually a summation of what I just sort of went through uh, as to uh, what we were uh, mentioning. Now to even get to the stage where we're visualizing data, we have to make sure that we have high quality and clean data, meaning that these, uh, the data are internally consistent and we've eliminated as many missing elements from them as we can. We also need to have strong documentation so that we actually know what, what are in the data and how to, how to interpret them. And, uh, we, and, and all of this is to the service from that first point there, that data visualization is really only as good as the data that it sees. Uh, it won't magically produce anything if the data are not, uh, are not sound as well. And in many cases, we actually need multiple tools, and I'll talk a little bit more about tools later, but multiple tools are necessary to house the data, to configure the data, and to display the data. In fact, the displaying of the data might actually be the, that's what the visualization part is, but 
the other parts are just as important as well. So how do we choose what visualizations we want to create? To answer that question, I say that we have to answer two other questions, which are on the screen here. What type of data or variables are we visualizing? And what type of relationships do we want to explore uh, between and among these variables? So to our first question, what type of variables? Here's just kind of a, a main uh, table that sort of summarizes some of the key types of variables that we would run across in an uh, early warning system. The first, the first row, are nominal variables. These simply separate data into categories with no, uh, with no order implied. They're, um, they're names, they're labels, things like ethnicity, gender, so forth. Uh, the second set of variables are, are what you call ordinal variables, in which the values actually represent a certain order or ranking. And a good example of this would be a scale in a questionnaire where uh, someone is asked to rate something from very important to not at all important on a kind of one to five scale. Finally, another type of variables that we'll see here are uh, or, uh, continuous variables, which can take on any value between two points uh, inclusive. So an example would be test scores or anything that, that can be expressed as a percentage where uh, the number of a percentage is either a zero, a 100, or anything in between. So once we've actually kind of assessed that, what variables we have to work with, we have to, and we've determined that, our research questions will then determine what are the type of relationships uh, within and between them that we want to show. And here I'm going to focus on six types of relationships, as noted here in this list. Comparison by category, change over time, parts of a whole, distribution of the variable, correlation, and progress to a goal. Here's an example of a simple comparison of data by categorical or nominal variables. Uh, it's a percent proficient by subject of Minnesota high school graduates taken from the Minnesota State Longitudinal Data System compared by the categories of male and female. Now, bar charts are probably the most common and useful way to represent nominal or character data. And actually, if you look at it, there's actually two categorical variables in this image. They're the gender variable and the subject one, math, reading, science. So our brains are actually pretty good at perceiving the length and height of bars uh, so that they can actually make a, an easy comparison across categories. Now, the previous slide was a snapshot of 2015. But if we want to illustrate change over time, a line graph with uh, time placed on a horizontal axis and the metric being analyzed being placed on the vertical axis uh, is a very powerful way to show change over time. Now, this slide actually comes from our May webinar. It's uh, something that Rolf mentioned about the Chicago Public Schools. And it illustrates the change in the percent of Chicago public school high school students considered to be on track to graduation over a period from 2002 to 2013. Uh, and also, they've actually helped to illuminate what was actually going on in terms of some of the interventions, some of the policy changes, by adding these labels at various points in time along this timeline. So the labels help call attention to what interventions were used or what other changes might have helped to explain some of these differences uh, as we go along from 2002 to 2013 and as the odd track uh, level goes from 59% up to 82%. So sometimes we actually want to see how a population or a data set is uh, broken up. We want to see how uh, uh, the parts of it are divided or segmented. We want to know what are the, part, is the parts that form the whole. Here's an example that uses data on race and ethnicity of Virginia 12th graders uh, from the Virginia Department of Education 2015 data. The, and it's in, rendered into a pie chart. Um, pie charts are popular and they can be useful, but I think that a lot of data visualization specialists uh, believe them to be fairly limited. Uh, once you get beyond three or four wedges, uh, they're very difficult to, for our, our visual perception to process, especially as the, we the wedges get smaller. 
Note that the software here automatically collapsed the three smallest categories, racial ethnic categories, into kind of a generic other category between the white and Asian there. So for that reason, a number of uh, visualization experts, particularly Stephen Few, rec recommends using a bar graph sorted by quantity. And this one is an example of using the same data set, the same data, and showing it in a different way. Uh, because it actually helps because, one, the, the length of the bars can be easily compared, and you can see the relative sizes of them against each other. And second, uh, the, as it turns out, the, this visualization allows us to actually see the smaller groups. They're not collapsed into a generic other category in the two or more races, American Indian, and so on at the bottom there. When we're working with large data sets, large amounts of data, it's often very useful also to understand the distribution of the data. Uh, for example, a data set on, on students with, uh, of their test scores, for example. Um, and this is a type of visualization that helps us to do that. It's a box and whiskers chart that is a good way to summarize continuous numerical data like test scores, like percentages. This chart here divides the data into percentiles. I think a lot of the educators on the uh, call will, will, will be familiar with that language as percentiles, where the rectangle includes the 25th to the 75th percentile, and the whiskers, which are those vertical lines on the ends of each chart, they represent the maximum and the minimum values. And the thick line in the middle of the box uh, represents the median, where half the data points are above and half are below. So here, and this is based on some sample data that we worked with here uh, at NORC. Here, uh, the dots re represent schools, and they're color-coded to the legend down in the bottom left-hand corner there. Where, and so the, the box charts, so the box and whiskers charts, show where the, each school sort of lines up, the, each school in this particular district line up on this measure of percent proficient in math and reading, uh, in which each box plot is actually segmented further by showing the concentration of former uh, English language learning students and current Eng and, and English language learning students and shows the comparison of those two uh, groups of data together. When you have two continuous variables, you might also want to see how they vary uh, and how they correlate together. Do they, do they, are they both high? Are they both low when they're put against each other? Does one increase and the other one decrease at the same time, or do they not have any relationship to each other? So a scatter plot, which is used, which is shown here, is an example where you can actually provide that picture of that two-variable or bivariate relationship. This example is actually taken from the West Virginia uh, Department of Education, and it graphs uh, the percent proficient in math in the 2009-2010 school year, that's the, that's the metric that's going up uh, on the vertical axis, against the median student growth percentile in the subsequent year. That's what's going on the horizontal axis. So, so we're basically trying to, to compare among all schools in the state uh, the achievement in one year to the growth in the following year and see how those, those schools sort of array. The other extra element is that each dot represents a school in the state, and the size of the dot represents the size of the school in terms of the number of students. And so by putting these two variables against each other and plotting them on this kind of graph, it helps to see how the state schools can be arrayed across that continuum from low achievement, low growth, to high achievement, high growth. And I think that the, uh, the visualization is helped by putting the labels that sort of divide those dimensions uh, in, that you see in each kind of corner of the, uh, of, of the image. Finally, an early warning system is also about measuring progress toward a goal, such as making sure that all students are on track to graduate. Uh, this type of dot plot, again, based on some sample data we worked with here at NORC, um, is one way to show that. It's not the only way, it's just kind of one way. This is one way to represent that movement uh, toward a goal. Here, each dot represents a school, and its position tells how close to the goal, uh, the very ambitious goal, of 100% proficiency each school is. Uh, these data, of course, as you can see, are sorted um, by their 2013 results. Uh, so you can see, uh, and you can kind of see that just by the pattern of the dots. 
Uh, and then we can look back at the earlier years to see the degree of progress or not that each school has. And so we can see the comparison between, say, school A at the top, that's maybe, I don't know, 75 or 80 percent, uh, uh, got to that 75, 80 percent proficiency uh, level versus uh, school K at the bottom there, which is at about halfway, uh, halfway there. So anyway, this is a good, quick way of understanding or summarizing uh, a lot of data in one small image. Now, I hope that some of these previous visualizations take some inspiration from the data visualization expert, uh, Edward Tufte, who's kind of one of the founders of the data visualization. Uh, he has his classic text, uh, the, the Visual Display of Quantitative Information, uh, is, provides some excellent guidance to go about thinking about how to, uh, to produce these sorts of visualizations. And here are some of his main tips uh, from, uh, from that book. Uh, and I think if you were to summarize them, the gist of them are show the data and show them honestly. And when he says maximize uh, the parts of the image that show the data, when he talks about maximizing data ink, or maybe you would say in the 21st century pixels, uh, we want to maximize the parts of the image that show the data and help us to understand them while trying to remove and stripping away everything else that kind of gets in the way of us understanding the data and to also take away unnecessary visual effects, which um, Tufty calls chart junk in that book. And then, of course, revising and editing uh, is very important. And if we're going to label data, we actually should label the data very clearly and make sure that it's close to the data that it's labeling so people don't have to go back and forth across pages to understand what the various parts of an uh, image are. So here's an example of representing data honestly. Uh, both of these bar charts are based on exactly the, sam uh, the same sample data. I mean, they're just made up data. Uh, but uh, the one on the right starts at three, whereas the one on the left correctly starts at zero. It's kind of a principle, you know, always start your bar charts at zero because uh, you can see how, how, by not starting at zero, you can see how the difference distorts the image and therefore making the quantities distorted as well. It sort of makes the categories, the third and fourth category there, categories three and four, seem a lot smaller than they really are when you actually look at the data as they really are over on the left side. And so if our images distort our data, we're not gaining insight from them. And Tufty also has some other points about when we're comparing things, we should compare things as apples to apples. So should, we should use measures like um, per capita uh, measures or um, class sizes, uh, cla cla uh, class size ratios, things that actually sort of normalize the data across a lot of different um, uh, sizes of uh, things that we're comparing. When he talks, talks about data ink and pixels and chart junk, this slide sort of summarizes some more detail what he actually means by that. So here he's saying that uh, grid lines, which are very standard things to see on graphs, they should be sort of reduced to a minimum or eliminated altogether. Those are those crosshatches that you see on graphs, kind of from uh, old school kind of graph paper, that oftentimes you don't really need to actually help you to understand the relationships in the data. And so for that reason, he's in favor of erasing as many elements from your visualization as, are, as possible, especially if they're not related to the data, avoiding special effects, and of course, making labels easy to read and proximate to the data, uh, as I mentioned earlier. So if Tucky were to design an illustration of a chart junk, he might make something like this. Um, this, I, I created this actually from uh, data uh, that, that was, data was collected by the NORC AP Center from a survey of older Americans on the factors that, uh, for determining their time of retirement. So why is this a bad visualization? Uh, first of all, you have the unnecessary effects of 3D images, a color that gradient that starts light and kind of gets darker into the background, uh, which makes everything else harder to read. Uh, most important data on this, on this, um, uh, uh, from these data, this data set is sort of buried. You're kind of not even sure what to focus on, given the fact that there's all these bars uh, in in the field there. In fact, the reddish bars in the foreground closest to your, your, uh, your vision are actually the, num the percent of people who named that particular factor, in fact, is listed across the bottom there, 
as not at all important. So again, that's probably not the uh, most important. If it's not at all important, it's probably not that important to put it out there uh, on the chart. And also you have a, um, you have over on the side a legend that's hard to read and hard to connect to the colors of the bars. Now you can take the same data and present it in a different way. So here, following some of the, the Tufty principles, we can make a graph that actually helps the reader to see the story in the data. So first off, you can see that all the unnecessary 3D and multiple colors have been removed, and the grid lines have been cut, have actually been mostly removed and have been reduced to just sort of tick marks along the bottom uh, of the horizontal axis there. The bars show the percentage of people who say that particular factor, the financial needs, health reasons, and so on, uh, is most is important or very important. And the data are also sorted, uh, not in the way the order of the, the, they appeared in the questionnaire, but the way that they actually um, came out in terms of the answers to the, uh, uh, to the question. So they're sorted so that the most important factors clearly rise to the top of the, um, of the image. And also the takeaway uh, label right at the top there that says nearly seven in 10 older Americans say their financial needs are important to the timing of their retirement. That takeaway summarizes the main point of this image and it's the sort of thing that really helps uh, viewers to understand your data. Now, I mentioned earlier that color is a very important element in, in graphics, but I think we should always be very conscious about using it very consciously and deliberately. Uh, and I think a good place to start is is noted here, it's the REL Guide to Graphic Design, which is uh, available for download uh, on uh, the REL websites. And um, it goes through some of these guidelines, which I think are very good, is that, and, and uh, some of them are, are sound obvious, but they may not be, because a lot of software allows you to make all sorts of different colors, and you actually have to be fairly conscious about which ones you use. They should be obviously easy to read. Uh, they should be consistent, meaning that if you have a number of, um, of uh, graphs in a row that compare, say, men and women, uh, if you determine that, uh, that men are one color and women are another color in the two, uh, in the, the number of graphs, they should not vary from one to another to confuse the reader. We should use similar color tones. Uh, it's also important that when you're actually creating data visualizations that you think about that there are limitations that are, that are created by the um, people in the population who have red-green color blindness. So it actually helps for you to think through what kind of colors to change. And then also in this guide, there are, there are uh, references to different tools that can help you to determine what kind of colors are best to use to avoid uh, the issues of color blindness for your viewers. And also, just to, as the end here, to note that oftentimes, because an end use might be in a, uh, a photocopy or something, in black and white, actually it's shown that black, white, and shades of gray can actually be fairly uh, effective in communicating data as well. Now, as I mentioned earlier, there are many tools uh, that are uh, used to create uh, data visualizations, and new ones seem to be appearing every day. Uh, this chart is certainly not exhaustive, and I'm sure there's other people on the line who have other uh, softwares that they've used and so on. Um, and, but it just kind of gives you a sense of the range of the tools that are available while, while I'm trying to give sort of an, uh, the, uh, the pros of each and some of the questions you might want to ask as you evaluate using any of these. But every tool from Excel, uh, which actually has quite a few uh, data visualization capabilities, to online open source tools in the second row, to the more customized software, including very sophisticated statistical software, are all available. And the determining factors, I think, will be uh, for choosing those will, of course, be cost, ease of use, uh, the learning curve necessary to make them work. And I've tried to array them roughly from top to bottom with what could be considered the easiest or the most available um, at the top and the more sophisticated ones that might require more specialized coding knowledge at the bottom. Um, I think that is a, at least a, a guidepost to some of the tools that are out there, and I encourage people to uh, experiment with them. And one thing I just wanted to note is that I put uh, the, the red asterisks uh, next to the uh, particular tools. Those indicate that uh, that particular tool was used to create at least one visualization that is shown in this presentation. So now I'd like to just close this segment of the presentation by just circling back to a few of the, a few of the kind of major themes and takeaways. 
and as caveats. So again, as I said earlier, data visualization requires quality data and a thorough knowledge of them. It also may require a lot of processing and shaping of the data before they can even be visualized, before they're even ready to be visualized. And it's also important, again, considering the tools that are available, that just because a particular type of visualization is possible, it doesn't necessarily make it desirable. Uh, it all should be driven by the questions that we ask and actually trying to come up with the, the most insight uh, from the, the, the simplest type of visualization. And as uh, Tufty uh, puts it, uh, graphical excellence consists of complex ideas communicated with clarity, precision, and efficiency. And so now I will uh, pass off control to Dr. Munoz, who will talk about how data visualization helps uh, working in Jefferson County, Kentucky Public Schools. coming from the presentation by Rolf, and the presentation by Lance. Uh, basically, like, you know, like this concept of using multiple measures, this idea of looking for actionable, actionable data, because that's exactly where I sit, like in Jefferson County Public Schools. Uh, we want to use the data. We're actually acting and acting quickly because we're working in an environment where, where we're talking about priority schools, so uh, high stakes, high stakes setting, uh, and we wanna make a big difference in the lives of kids. So today we're gonna be talking about uh, basically giving you an overview of, of the district just to put some context. Also a little bit of an overview of data systems that we currently have in our system, and then how is it that we use that data, those data systems to actually support the work in priority schools, including uh, all these principles associated with data visualization. We, we are a large urban district. We're talking about 100,000 kids, over 100,000 kids in Jefferson County, uh, 172 school sites, uh, and in my area, I'm responsible for 18 priority schools. Two of them are elementary schools, who are middle, eight middle and eight high schools. So a, a grand total of 18 schools. And as you can see in the map, it, they are distributed all over the county. Uh, one of the pieces that, that uh, is important to understand is that we are dealing with a population of, of, of schools with a high, high percentage of kids on free and reduced lunch, high student mobility, and a high percentage of, of truancy. And we, we all know that all these are, are, are factors that, that have a, an important uh, saying in how we go about, about working in schools that I think that uh, we have to acknowledge uh, all the difficulties associated with, with, with poverty. Another piece of information that is relevant to put uh, the work in Jefferson County in priority schools in context is to, is to see the teacher data. And with the teacher data, as you can see, typically like in priority settings, and I, I think that that's nationwide, uh, well, we, we have less, less years of teaching experience, and we also have difficult, difficulty in retaining teachers because basically in these settings, like teachers have to be more than than just teachers. They have to be social workers, they have to be counselors, they have to be sometimes even like uh, like sort of parents in local parents because we are dealing with lots of kids who, who are living either in single parent homes or simply in, in the foster care system. These are our challenges, our academic challenges. Uh, Basically, like what we're trying is to improve, uh, move more kids from, from the lowest performing category, which is novice in the state of Kentucky, trying to move them to apprentice and from apprentice to professional or distinguished. Uh, no matter where the kids are, we, we, have to, uh, we have to 
uh, grow grow them as learners, and we have to work hard to get this consistent growth. Now let's talk now about the data system and how they support the work in priority schools. And this is one of the systems that we have. We we call it Cascade, but it's a, it's a local assessment system like like many other school systems have, but it's very helpful in a quickly quickly knowing what's the status of learning at any given time. We know exactly how the kids are doing in diagnostic assessments, how they are doing in proficiency assessments, and these are done, uh, you know, every every nine weeks, every nine weeks. And we have some, some graphs, uh, some chart graphs, bar graphs, and some uh, pie charts that really help, you know, to kind of like visualize really quickly where, where we are. Uh, I think that this is important to, to make sure that the people, especially like the new teachers, uh, can see that, that, that don't be intimidated by the data, but be able to kind of feel comfortable. And it's a process they, they, don't, they don't do right away, especially like the new teachers, but we make sure that they, there are some uh, support like by data coaches, people that, that know how to look at the data so that that way they can quickly get to know this, uh, this local assessment system that we have. Uh, but academics is not everything. As Rolf was saying, uh, we gotta think in terms of multiple measures. So we also have a, a dashboard that helps a lot with behavior data. And uh, it's, it's, it has some demographic information, so we can also look at the behavior data not as an isolated piece of data, but also see it in the context of, 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 other, of, of other information. Something very important, particularly at the high school level, is the use of the dashboard associated with college and career readiness, because we want to know at any given time during the school year how are kids doing in meeting benchmarks associated with college and career readiness. Uh, that's actually a, an element of the state's accountability system. We're talking about a 20% out of the 100% is associated with college, which call, with college and career readiness. Also, uh, pretty important is to know the, the school climate, the school culture. We know that academics and culture, they go hand by hand, like they, they are uh, tightly linked. And we, we want to make sure to know what are the perceptions from, from kids, what are the perceptions from teachers, what are the perceptions from parents, because we need to make sure that all the key stakeholders have a saying in, in what's going on in the school. And uh, sometimes, you know, the, the, the academic issues uh, at the root might be associated with school climate matters. So, so we want to make sure to keep a, a good hand of what's going on in terms of, of, of school climate in, in our schools. Here are some, some examples of how we have some more formal reports throughout the year. Uh, this is one that we that we call the halftime report, uh, where you know you can see the schools and you can see how they are doing in the current year as compared to the prior year. And we have used uh, different color color coding so that it can be easily understood if uh, if we're moving in the right direction or if we're not with you know using the green and the red. And uh, basically, given the complexity of the accountability system. Uh, which hopefully is going to change for for next school year, for 17-18. Uh, but uh, right now, you know, like we have all these elements associated with the with the system. But hopefully, you know, if it gets simplified, I think that that this data is going to look even much much better. The understanding of the data is going to be improved. Uh, but in the meantime, you know, this is what we have, and this is what we, we, we have been doing for, for the last uh, couple of years. Uh, and basically, just to give like a little quick uh, overview of the system, at the high school level in Kentucky, we have, uh, we have five factors. We have achievement, we have gap, we have growth, we have college and career readiness, 
we have graduation rate. Uh, those are kind of like the main pieces. Then we also have this something that we call the program review. Here's another example because we gotta again like keep uh, keep constantly working on 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 this data to monitor the performance, but but more than monitoring, making sure that what we find happening in the in in the data, well, that we quickly act on the data. Sometimes it can be celebrating because we gotta make sure to celebrate when we see good good trends in the data, good progress in the data, but. Uh, when we see that the data is not going in the right direction, we gotta quickly act to try to see if we can change the negative trajectory of the trend data. Uh, so here again, the same kind of a similar report to the halftime report, but just uh, just an update by the third quarter of the year of, of how we're doing. At this point, I'm gonna I'm gonna turn it to Lance. Lance? Got it. Thank you, uh, Dr. Munoz. Well, when we visualize data, we're trying to find patterns. But the reason we're doing this, of course, uh, is to, uh, to see the patterns and what they're telling us about the educational or social indicators or phenomena that they're trying to measure. And if we put it a different way, what we're trying to do is to find a story in the data. And what we want to tell that story to others, we need to combine visualization and narrative to help the audience understand and to be interested in the story. Uh, those two things go together uh, very well. And in approaching this task, we can actually take a page from uh, common narratives like novels or films. Um, they use this kind of common narrative structure where uh, the, um, uh, there's a problem that's established at the beginning. Uh, and then much of the action is about figuring out how to deal with that problem and elaborating it. And then at the end, uh, resolving it. Uh, you can probably think of a detective novel or a whodunit or I don't know, maybe uh, Luke Skywalker figuring out how to uh, both uh, conquer the empire but also um, you know, find out about his uh, own uh, family and so on. But these are all the kind of problems that are dealt with in very common uh, narrative structures. Uh, and all of these also keep, uh, especially when we're working with data, we have to also keep the audience in mind to help them understand the story uh, that are, that's in the data. But, so if we take advantage of that narrative structure and set up our, our, da our data and allow our, our audiences to kind of walk through it with our help, it actually really helps in their understanding. So here I will take, I'll kind of try to develop this using an example uh, from uh, data from the Everyone Graduate Center uh, for a state report for the state of West Virginia. This slide in particular uh, appeared in our May webinar. By way of background, uh, Rolf went through some of this. The Everyone Graduate Center at Johns Hopkins University publishes um, annual state profiles that track each state's progress to attaining a goal of having a 90% high school graduation rate by uh, the year 2020. And so the, what the reports do, and there's one for each state, they sort of look at a background for each state, provide a context, and then in a the slide like this, they summarize its progress and challenges toward meeting that goal, the progress, and also some of the things that it still has to achieve to get there. And then at the end, it offers some economic projections uh, based on some economic modeling uh, for the state that what would happen if the state did attain the, that 90% uh, uh, rate um, uh, at goal. Now, one thing about this particular slide, there's a lot of information here and a lot of data on it. Um, and, it and it turns out that some of these, that most of these actually state reports are actually some, somewhat set up in that uh, narrative structure in the way I just described it, right? Gives the context, talks about the, the challenges, and then talks about what would happen if the, if the goal is met. And so, um, but if you look at this uh, particular slide, for example, there's like at least 22 numbers on this, um, on this slide. And so it actually might be very challenging uh, for readers to kind of go look through this to kind of see what some of the main takeaways um, are. 
But if we take some of these numbers and we illustrate them with visualizations and then use that, those visualizations to supplement our text, we can really make that story uh, come alive. Uh, this particular visualization is based on the introductory data, or sorry, the introductory um, discussion that sets the context uh, for the report on West Virginia and where it notes um, about the, uh, the, the, the place that at, uh, West Virginia is in the country in relationship to the rates of child poverty and the rates of, of college completion. And so that's, that's one of the contexts of the problems here. And you, uh, so what I've done here is I've sort of these, each of these dots represents the state uh, graphed by, uh, this is a scatter plot, <laughs> graphed uh, on the vertical axis by the uh, percent of, of students with, or percent of people 25 and older with bachelor's or higher degrees. And then at the bottom, running across the horizontal axis is the number of children living in poverty. Both of these, uh, data, are these data are taken from the uh, U.S. Census Bureau. And so you can see I've highlighted where West Virginia stands in this broader trend. And what um, the West Virginia policymakers, people, educators, I'm sure would want to see the, that dot move up and to the left. Increase, West college uh, uh, child poverty increased uh, high school graduation rate. So this sets up the problem. Although there's a relationship between child poverty and college completion, many states with higher rates of child poverty uh, than West Virginia have a higher college completion rate. So the question then is, how can West Virginia improve? So I took a few of the numbers that were on that uh, earlier slide uh, and um, put them into what are called slant graphs, the slant charts. Um, and they give a really good quick visual sort of assessment or, or summary of, of some of the, uh, the challenges involved. So one of the ways to increase college completion there is to prepare students to succeed and be on track for high school graduation. So these graphics then quickly show where West Virginia has improved. Uh, that's that grade eight math proficiency on the right uh, and where it needs further work. For example, the grade four reading proficiency on the left. Uh, but again, these charts give really quick summation over a decade of 20, 2003 to 2013. They kind of give you a quick uh, look at what the trend or the trends are. And so to provide context also, we've included the comparable statistics in that kind of gray for all U.S. public schools uh, retrieved from the U.S. Department of Education's National Assessment of Educational Progress website. Those, these are both data from that, uh, from that website. Uh, so the West Virginia data on this, in these visualizations are from that table that I showed a few slides back, but I think that these visualizations give you an example of how uh, using the visual can actually help bring out the story in the data and really make an impact. Now, to reach a goal of 90% high school graduation, uh, either in four-year or five-year cohorts, requires increasing the graduation rate uh, at between one or two percentage points a year between 2015 and 2020. And this line graph here illustrates that this is an achievable goal, uh, provided that the policies uh, help to reinforce it. And um, so what I've done here is I've graphed the actual data that we, uh, that we have on graduation rates for both those cohorts from 2010 to 2015, and then I've just taken a kind of uh, just a straight line sort of projection to uh, a setting 2020 at 90% just to see kind of what would actually be required in terms of a year-by-year -year improvement to get to that, um, to de to get to that point. And of course, to get to that point, it suggests a solution to the problem that we were talking about earlier, which, for example, could be uh, an, an early warning system. It, it will include various policies and interventions, including an early warning system. And I think this is just one example uh, of how to, to follow that narrative structure uh, from setting up the problem, elaborating it, and, and solving it, uh, and using the illustrations to tell a story with the data where the visualization and the text reinforce uh, each other. So that is the, the end of the seg segment on um, telling stories with data, but I just wanted to go back and just leave you with a few takeaways here on uh, the concepts of data visualization, how they relate to the work that we're involved with. So keep in mind, as I have said a couple times, uh, 
good data visualization requires good data and knowing what insights the, that those data can reveal. Learning which visualizations are most appropriate for the, for the variables and relationships that you want to display. And that's kind of a trial and error process. Some, some visualizations uh, may be better than others, uh, but it's, it's worth experimenting and seeing and, and testing them with an audience. And coming to Tufti's sort of uh, admonitions, one is, above all, show the data. Keep the visualizations clean and simple. Take away as much as you can in order to highlight what the data are showing. Uh, and when you talk about color, use color to communicate and not to decorate. Color really should be, again, be used to kind of reinforce your message but not sort of distract from it. And, of course, all visualizations should be designed with your audience or audiences in mind. You want to make them understand and be um, interested in the data and actually get as enthusiastic about them as you are. And so we actually want to make it, we don't want to make it difficult for them to understand the data. We want to actually make them want to know more about it. And good visualization really helps to do that. So thanks for your attention today. Okay, thank you everyone. Um, now we have reached the portion of our event where we would like to hear from you. If there are any questions that you have for any of our speakers, please feel free to enter those questions in the Q&A panel now located at the right-hand side of your screen. And we will pose those questions um, verbally to the speakers so that everyone has the benefit of hearing those answers. In the meantime, while we're waiting for you to enter those questions, if um, you could even start us off, Rolf, with um, some beginning questions for our speakers, and that also may help generate some thought among the participants of what they may like to ask. We have approximately 10 to 15 minutes for questions, so um, Rolf, if you'd like to go ahead, I will um, monitor the questions that are coming in and then pick up when you're finished. Okay, I will, yeah, thanks very much. Um, I was really intrigued by uh, what Lance and uh, Marco were able to provide for us. Um, I had two quick questions for um, for Marco Munoz um, based on what he was reporting. One was um, uh, how much how much time how do they work out with the teachers and administrators in the priority school so they can get them. Uh, familiarity and training with the reports and with the data. How do you how do you fit in the time and how much time do they get for the training? And if I might, I'd just like to toss out a second quick one. Uh, we've been talking a lot about growth data and gap measures, and you mentioned those in your as your key two of your key indicators. Uh, what have you noticed about? Uh, how does the growth measure or gap measure help uh, teachers? How, how have they responded to those kind of measures? I know we talk a lot about those, but just from your, you know, on the ground perspective, how do you see those? Absolutely. Thank you, Rolf. Those are some uh, important questions. Um, for the first one associated with the teachers and administrator, we have ongoing professional development uh, uh, that it's actually taken taken two two approaches. Okay, one is the the one that we use like for say the summer institutes or when we have the the principal meetings, and so that's the that's the one that is out of school uh, professional development. But the second one, which which is the one that we think that has been more effective, is the job embedded professional development in their professional learning communities. You see, all teachers are part of a professional learning community. And basically there, one of the key elements of, of, of a successful professional learning community is to dedicate time to improve their, their assessment literacy. Because assessment is guiding the work. It, it's the one that is helping us find out who are the key, kids that uh, that are learning, who are the kids that are not learning, and that we need to quickly intervene. And also, it tells us 
uh, of course, about, about uh, you know, teacher effectiveness. Now, uh, administrators also belong to professional learning communities. We, we call them the, the principals, professional learning communities. So uh, they are in groups of four or five or sometimes more principals, and they get together and they look at the data together. So they are actually like, you know, constantly uh, helping each other out in how to go about understanding the data. And then more importantly, what are the next ex steps associated with the data? Because I think that that uh, over the last couple of years, we have been moving from just uh, using like the data as a diagnostic, but now using more like the data as a prognostic, meaning that, that we're taking action with the data. Uh, so I guess that a little bit of the medical model. Now, in terms of, of your second question associated with, with achievement and gap, uh, and how the teachers respond to that data. Well, there's a there's a big conversation going on right now throughout the state of Kentucky because we are envisioning a new system and there's gonna be a proposal, hopefully by the end of this uh, year, uh, so that we can implement the new, the new system in the, in the forthcoming school year. Uh, right now, uh, the current system is quite a bit confusing for, for teachers. Uh, lots of uh, formulas, uh, lots of details associated with how to compute uh, achievement scores and gap scores and uh, even this concept of growth because in the state of Kentucky we use something that is called the student growth percentiles. And uh, you know, uh, then we're talking about uh, a percentile regression I mean, it's a, it's just a, it's just a complicated topic to really, to really deal with. Uh, but I tell you what, one thing that we're clear in Kentucky is that the most important assessment is the one that happens in the classroom. So, so the formative assessment is is kind of like uh, the one that we know from the research, uh, from Black and, and Williams, uh, how how much of an impact it, it really has on student learning. So. Basically, those are the big points uh, to answer your two questions. One additional thing that I would just add is that it's important for new teachers to have a, a, a like we call it a priority teacher institute. We just had one this summer, and this priority teacher institute was for new teachers going into priority schools, and it was pretty important, you know, because we were giving them the tools to hit the road running. So, uh, so they need they need a lot of support, and throughout the year we're going to, we're figuring out ways where we can have a mentor to support them, and also make sure you know that that they have everything that they need to be successful because the setting, uh, the priority school setting is quite demanding. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks for your insight. Appreciate it. Thank you very much. We do have some questions that have come in. Um, Beth Ann has asked, can someone speak to Section 508 compliance? I understand some states and districts have been sued. Um, do one of our speakers want to take on that question? I can say just a couple things uh, and defer to others, too, if, um, to discuss more district level. Uh, but it's something we at NRC have to uh, uh, comment. We have to um, build a lot of our systems with uh, uh, to be 508 compliant meaning that, that they're accessible to uh, people with disabilities. Uh, the, and um, I think there's a couple things I just point out uh, related to, to this particular topic is one, a lot of the data uh, that are shown on dashboards or, dis, or distributed online are obviously on websites. Uh, and uh, the GSA, the, the Government Services Agency, I think that's what it stands for, uh, is, uh, the, uh, has uh, a lot of resources up online to, um, uh, to uh, 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 instruct uh, and to test how websites are, are, uh, um, are accessible uh, under the 508 uh, technical uh, uh, procedure, uh, technical um, uh, uh, list of requirements. Uh, the other um, thing I would notice is, or note is that um, when I spoke about uh, color choices and color blindness, there are, uh, that is, would be another uh, aspect in terms of being able to uh, provide uh, data visualizations that are accessible to people who have uh, that red-green uh, 
disability, uh, red green vision disability, or uh, and um, there are again both at the GSA and some other sites that are that are um, listed in that rail graphic design um, uh, website or sorry graphic design download that I mentioned that actually give you tools online in which you can uh, submit colors color choices you can even your design of a particular visualization that you want to show. And you can sort of give an idea, the, the softwares can actually tell you whether they are uh, compliant in the sense that whether people with color blindness can perceive them. And we'll also suggest color choices that can actually work if, if the particular visualization you design does not meet those standards. So I think those are just a couple of points I would make about, about this. Okay, thank you. And we have one other question from Martin. And the question asks, is there any data to show the extent to which teachers and building administrators are using interaction with data dashboards, for example, access and utilization rates? How do you know that the end users are using the data? Yeah, I can, I can take care of that question. Uh, we definitely, like, have a, a monthly a log with that with the activities associated with our dashboards we we know exactly how many people are accessing we also know what type of of people you know are using it because we're expecting that this should be used at all levels of the system all the way from the assistant superintendents to the school principals to the instructional leadership teams which include the assistant principals the counselors uh, and other administrators, uh, also the teachers, and that for me is kind of like the most important piece, making sure that, that the teachers are accessing and utilizing the system so that they can see exactly what the, where the kids are. Another way also that is not through the, through the internet, another way of, of knowing the amount of use is when we do a, uh, observations of professional learning communities. That's another way of, of, of seeing how how the data is being used because it should be at the center of the discussions. Like any time that we were discussing in, in professional learning communities, bringing data is just kind of like the like the ticket of entrance for for you know for entering in the PLC. You don't have data, then what is it that we're going to be talking about? Uh, because it's not a social event. Um, and uh, yeah, but I, I, I think that, that the most important thing is, is to go beyond, beyond the access to the data uh, and try to see how we can reach beyond, you know, beyond that to, to actually see what happens now that, now that we know what we know, what is it that, that, that is going to be happening? What's going to be the next instructional steps? Uh, and for me, uh, when working with teachers, what I see is that they are talking about, you know, the, the, the use of the mastery of learning approach where they do corrective teaching or also like, you know, implementing these tier two systems so we can, we can take care of the kids who, who didn't get it the first time. And also, well, for some cases, you know, where, where the need is ex extremely high, well, we got to think about a tier three intervention. And we also, you know, in some circumstances, you know, think about if we are educating the kids at the right uh, setting, because we also have a, a set of, of alternative schools in our system. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Um, at this time, we do not have any other questions. I'm going to turn it back over to Liza to wrap up our event today and also share with you about our stakeholder feedback survey. So, Liza? Wonderful. Thank you so much uh, for allowing us, Rel Appalachia, to make this presentation to all of the different attendees. Um, also want to uh, 
send out a special thanks to the presenters today, and thank you for sharing your knowledge and your expertise. Now, as Jennifer mentioned, we do have a survey that we would kindly ask that all of the attendees take a little bit of time to fill out, specifically because um, we as an entity of IES are required to uh, hand in what we call the SFS surveys. You will all be receiving at the end of this presentation a survey monkey invitation, and that is what we would like for you to take a little bit of time, go through that, and please fill out what you think, what we could do a little bit better, um, and perhaps give us some ideas for our next EWS webinar. So that is all I need to say at this time, Jennifer. Anything else that you need to add? No, I think that's all. Thank you very much for your participation.